Hello everyone, this is as the video title implies, I ranked a list of Geometry Dash's main levels from worst to best. This doesn't include the additional games like Geometry Dash Meltdown, World, or Sub-Zero, as their purpose is to advertise the new features the game was showing off at the time. Nor does it include the secret challenge level hidden in the game, since let's be real, it's a giant pile of crap, and it doesn't really try to be anything else. So what we are going to be focusing on are the main 21 levels. Now normally when players have attempted to cover this topic, it has normally been either a bit dull to watch, or it has been the embodiment of cancer. But most importantly, the ranking has been covered by only one individual, usually the YouTuber themselves. This is fine, but I wanted to establish what the community thinks in a more general sense. I did this using Google Forms, and with an announcement on Twitter and YouTube, there were over 230 responses which will provide with a somewhat general opinion on what the truly worst and the best main levels in Geometry Dash is. With that said, let's kick off with what is deemed the worst of the bunch. And the worst of the bunch, it seems, is base after base, which I wasn't really expecting this one to be labeled the actual worst. It's not that the level itself is particularly bad, but more that it is what can be best described as a nothing level. Other than the part covered in darkness, there is nothing particularly new or fresh that stands out on its own. It is more of a repeat of things that we have already seen from the previous levels that came before it. You all seem to be pointing at the same thing, which is that it is forgettable. Quoting one of the people who participated in the survey, they stated, I like base after base. The problem with it though is how it feels like a remake of Dry Out, only slightly worse in every way. This level would have fit better had it gone before dry out, and also should have had some more thought put into it with structuring the gameplay. It is also clear that Robtop was running out of ideas for medium difficult main levels at this point. The level on its own isn't bad, it's just lacking in some areas. Even the ones who state that they really like the level also can't deny some of the things that this level lacks in a demonstrational front. While I absolutely love this level, I understand that it's not great from an objective standpoint. Nothing about it truly stands out as something to celebrate when the previous were able to do what base after base does, but better. The level also just has some of the worst overall coin placements out of all the main levels. The only exception I can think of is how it represents the music, and for that, it honestly does a great job. These comments really just sum up my feelings toward the level perfectly. It's a level that really brings nothing special and just does a worse job than the levels previously. There really isn't much else to be said, I'd be repeating myself if I kept going. So congratulations, base after base, you find yourself in the spot for the worst main level in Geometry Dash. I happen to personally know a lot of people who absolutely despise this level. Well, those players can now cheer up since Can't Let Go is deemed the second worst main level in the game. I gotta say though, there are definitely levels I would put below this one that showed up way after Can't Let Go. I find it rather baffling to see this level in particular to be so far down. To me, it seems more like what base after base was trying to be. It takes the same concepts from the level and elevates them to a higher format, executed way better. But I think this statement from a player would indicate why it has been so hated by many players. While I really like some parts of the level, like the first dark part which is really good sync and is overall good, this level's gameplay is quite bad. The reason for this is that it is very poorly balanced, going from base after base so this level can be quite tough for a new player. Not because the level is overall decently tricky, but because the first parts have surprisingly difficult timings, then drops off massively with the ship being easier than the one in dry out, and then follows the upside down section with its unreasonable difficulty for this level's timings. This level is infamous in the GD community, as it is a massive difficulty jump compared to the five levels before it. It definitely deserves a harder, even insane rating like it used to have back in the 2013 to 2014 days. I hate the can't let go jumps and the upside down cube is kind of unsight readable without prior practice or being good at the game. Yeah, there's definitely a common theme here. Coming from someone who started their days playing this game back on a mobile device in 2013 to 2014, I can definitely back up the statements in saying that the can't let go difficulty spike is immense and at times it can be genuinely overwhelming. The 71 to 85% section is absolutely insane compared to everything else the player had been introduced to prior. So I believe that the hate stems from the lack of proper balancing, which is a shame because despite the lack of that, I find myself enjoying this level quite fondly. But as the score of this level implies, putting a blind eye to the lack of balancing doesn't really make the problems of the level go away. I don't even want to mention what's on some people's minds right now. If you don't know what I'm talking about, good. You'll get actual brain damage if you find out. That brain damage aside, once more I am slightly surprised by this placement. I really shouldn't be considering this is one of the earliest levels so obviously it is going to be one of the lowest in quality compared to all the upcoming ones. 
But yeah, enough about me being surprised every damn time. Here we have found ourselves with back on track as the third worst. But I wouldn't say this level finds the placement here for anything negative in itself either. This level is the first introduction to the new jump pad mechanic, which definitely gives the level some originality points. One of you said, It's a pretty great level, starting by introducing the jump pads just at the very beginning. Showcases how it can benefit you, but also how it can be used as a way to trick you. Another one of you stated, I would say that similar to Stereo of Madness, Back on Track shows you the pads, which are the automatic version of something that will be shown in the next level. Both levels follow the same structure. It starts with cube gameplay and then the drop is with a ship. But it is way deeper than that. Back on Track feels easier than Stereo of Madness because there are no triple spikes, and you as a player are focusing more on the new mechanics of the level. I definitely agree with this statement. Back on track introduces the jump pad object instantly, and assuming the new player has no clue what to do, they will very quickly figure out how it works by just gliding into it. Then roughly 10% into the level, there are jump pads that try to kill you instead of helping you. It communicates the intent and mechanic beautifully. I don't fully stand behind the point regarding the absence of a triple spike as being worthy of praise, but I understand the thought process. But unfortunately, that's all there is to it. Other than some more block design being more intricate and varied, the level doesn't do much more and it doesn't need to. It could still be considered a tutorial level, so adding too many things to look at will make it overwhelming for new players. So at the very least, the placement for back on track on this list is appropriate, considering what levels are to come. Keeping up with the trend of the 1.0 levels all at once, here we have the fourth level of that update, Dry Out. Personally, I find this level to be rather insignificant apart from the great introductory to the upside down section. And even then, I have some gripes with this upside down section, specifically the ending of it. These last three pillars that the player needs to jump off are horribly aligned. There's a genuine chance, depending on if you jump off the first pillar by timing it as opposed to holding, you might miss the final pillar altogether. Having this problem in a main game level is terrible, and the stupid part about this is that it could have been very easily avoided. For some reason this final pillar has been moved a couple of pixels to the left, and even the spikes next to it. If you were to realign them back, it works way better, and even fixes the potential pillar skip. I don't understand what Robtop was doing here, there was no reason for any of this. But yeah, to calm down a bit, some of you seem to be stating the same things. Unfortunately, looking back, I find Dryout to be a bit underwhelming. The upside down gimmick was used only once, which kind of ruins it for me because it makes a level stand out just because of one single part, while the rest is just forgettable. The reverse gravity section could have been introduced more gently. It has some jumps that might be tricky for a new player to read even in normal gravity. Maybe that's just me being a noob, but other than that, there is nothing much else to say about the level. The rest of it is pretty fun and doesn't really throw anything new. There are some of you who stated that you really love this level though, such as an example being these players here. I really effing love Dryout. I feel like the level complements this song quite nicely alongside very pleasant gameplay. Gravity Portals carries the gameplay plus originality departments. 8 out of 10. The upside down part and the drop mixed together so well it honestly blew my mind the first time I saw it. Seeing a mysterious portal, hearing the music climax, then just flipping upside down is the coolest thing ever. Other than that, it's a pretty bland level. I think that would be the general summary to take from this. The originality score definitely comes from the upside down section, which while still having problems is executed efficiently. But the lack of complexity and variation in all the other sections surrounding it turns dry out into a rather bland level. Definitely not the worst of the bunch, but its issues overall lands this level in the bottom half of the list. And here we have arrived at what is truly considered the tutorial level of Geometry Dash, Theory of Madness, and it is ranked really low on the list. Once more, I don't think that this level is placed all the way at the bottom because it is particularly bad. The level is simple enough to account for the simplicity needed for a new player to understand the basics of the game. We start with a traditional cube that has been seen before in games like The Impossible Game, giving the player some very straightforward jumps with plenty of space between them. But what Robtop decided to implement that sets the game immediately apart from The Impossible Game comes at 32%, where a brand new game mode was introduced, the ship game mode. There were countless praises to this level made by you all, many of them would take way too long to discuss here, but I'll go ahead and showcase a couple of them. What an absolute masterclass on game design. This level does such an excellent job of teaching the basics without you even realizing. The first cube may honestly be a better invincible tutorial than 1-1 in Super Mario Bros. Just like the first Goomba in that game, the very first thing you see is the most basic hazard, a single spike, teaching you the basic jump. Quite possibly the best introduction to Geometry Dash mechanics that could be made. The gameplay from Zero to the ship is a perfect tutorial to the game's mechanics, introducing holding, music sync, and fakes. 
One complaint that did see arise from some of you was regarding the second half of the level. The first half of the level works very well as an introduction to the rest of the game, teaching you the basics of how the cube and the ship game mode work. However, I think that the second half of the level is much more difficult and people who are playing the game for the first time will probably have a hard time going through it. Even though I am personally indifferent to the triples, yeah, I can totally see that. Despite being nerfed triples, majority of new players can be seen to struggle on these immensely, which I will say is a genuine problem, considering the next two levels doesn't have a single triple. The true tutorial level has two of them, so I'd say this level finds itself in the correct spot that it should be in. Now here we have a surprise. There are still some 1.0 levels that haven't been mentioned on this list, and despite that, we are jumping up two versions into 1.2 with the level cycles. The views on this level between the community definitely seems to be a bit torn. There are those who really enjoy the level and believe it is underappreciated, then there are those who absolutely despise it. Let's look at what some players have to say about cycles. Cycles introduces to the ball game mode. I think this level flows very well together and does a quite good job in showing the player the basics of the new game mode too. Not to mention, the song representation in the gameplay is very on point. Though I personally don't like Cycles all that much, credit where it's due for introducing one of the most ubiquitous gameplay sequences with the ship and repeating gravity portals. And Ball is pretty cool too. Which, speaking of the ship part, is absolutely insane when first introduced to it. There are only two main levels prior to this one that involve gravity changes in a ship, and this was way too much for some players to handle. Much like Dryout, the general complaints seem to revolve around the bouncing of the entire level. Very annoying level, 60% of the parts are completely free, 40% are just really annoying. Like the deco though, especially the block cave on the first cube. After Time Machine, this level felt extremely disappointing. In the beginning, it's just triple spike spam and the drop feels anticlimactic when compared to Dry Out. Would be great if the first cube didn't suck so much ass. Personally, I definitely agree with the poor balancing issue. The pre-drop in the ship section is way harder than anything involving with the ball game mode. I understand that with a new game mode, you have to introduce it slowly. You can't force a new player to adapt to something difficult with something they've never played with before. Cycles does this relatively well. It shows you the ball game mode and gives you a bit of space to experiment before hazards begin showing up. But I really don't see why it had to be so much easier than what the other game modes were doing. Maybe the thought was that Cycles had to be the new hardest main level or something, but I wouldn't say that is justified. Maybe if the ship and pre-drop had been a bit easier, perhaps that would have been more tolerable. But the final result places Cycles on the 16th spot. Now here we have one hell of a divisive level. Time Machine got the most 1 out of 10 votes for gameplay out of the entire list of levels, and yet the level doesn't find itself at the very bottom. Well, I can tell you it is pretty damn easy to figure out why this level is so hated among the community. Two things, mirror portals and triple spikes. Let's start with the latter. This level has a lot of triple spikes, and I really mean a lot, excluding the triples where it is automatic or next to a block which makes it significantly easier. There are a total of seven triple spike jumps in this level. Many in the community talk about to this day how these jumps make the experience very frustrating, as it is brutal getting used to as a new player. Some comments from you all portray to this statement even further. From personal experience, it is pretty annoying considering the amount of triple spikes and I beat almost every other main level minus the demons and electric dynamics before I finally beat this. Time Machine has too many triple spikes. It is supposed to introduce you to the mirror portal gimmick, but in the end it feels more like a triple spike challenge than a mirror portal showcase to me. This level has potential, but it got ruined because of that, which is unfortunate as basically everything else is decent for its time. As opposed to someone who has made a YouTube career out of jumping over quadruple spikes, I don't think it can be denied that the amount of triple spike versus all the other main levels is overwhelming. Everything else on the other hand, majority of you appear to hold in high regards. Everything is perfect, but one noteworthy section in the level is right before the first time we went through a mirror portal, we were introduced into some interesting block structuring. The first ship is literally you going through a bunch of giant spike structures which looks like giant mouths with spiky teeth which feels like you're dashing through a giant castle while dodging dragons, which are trying to eat you. This is an observation I didn't even consider myself. While the decoration itself is actually very expressive considering the limitations, some being represented very nicely, and with a fair bit of originality to boot, Time Machine does have the makings of standing out as a really good level. Personally, I wouldn't hold it accountable for all the triples since I generally don't have a problem with them. They aren't exactly what you call unfair on its own. Much like a double spike, there's a certain space you need to cover when performing a jump. A triple just demands more precision from you, and even then, every single triple spike in Time Machine is nerfed. But putting my own personal bias aside, compared to all the other main levels, there are just too many of them. 
And don't even get me started with a mirror portal. When this feature was released, it might have seemed like a cool idea on paper, but this mechanic is literally a forgotten relic of the past. Not even the start position object has a mirror portal option now. People hate this feature in this level, and there are some of you who have described why this is the case. I would say Time Machine does a pretty decent job at introducing the mirror portals. However, some transitions are, in my personal opinion, a bit garbage, since the hazards are placed a bit too near the portal, so you might have trouble processing what's coming up so you will know when to jump. Pretty much the main issue with mirror portals and levels. In levels like Time Machine and many other user levels who utilize the mirror portal, there are instances where it is incredibly difficult to react in time before the hazard shows up. This is bad gameplay design, and unfortunately, there are sections where even Time Machine falls into this issue. So while I personally have no grab with this level per se, I can definitely understand the problems mentioned and get behind that Time Machine lands in the 15th spot. So consciously, I didn't really expect to see any 1.0 levels above levels from later updates, but here we are with Polargeist. The first four levels of the game introduces something new each time. Stereo Mandis introduces the ship, Back on Track introduces the jump pad, Dryout introduces the gravity portal, and Polargeist introduces the jump warp. This is the first level on this list so far that managed to get a higher score of 7 out of 10 on Music Sync, and I would definitely say that is proper here. Polargeist adds one of the game's most important features, the orbs. The level shows it in a very smart way, since the first jump of the level is a 4 spike jump that is impossible to do unless you click the board to jump, which I find super intuitive and simple. You and me both there. Much like the other aforementioned levels introducing new mechanics, Polar Guys is one of the best examples you're going to find in the main level pack doing this right. Out of the 1.0 style levels, it also has the most unique approach to syncing to the song with the descending staircases. This would be a theme reused in later levels, but in the original pack, Polargeist is the only one to properly do this, and it definitely benefits from it. The only actual complaint that I have seen from the level comes from how the third coin was implemented in later updates. The only problem I have with this level is the third coin, that is just way too hard for it to be a third level of the game. I know coins were introduced on a later update, but I think it's still worth noticing. I would agree with that as well. The third coin is genuinely insane. Visually, it is a very different timing compared to everything else we have seen, and because of how close the boot pad is to its left side structure, it can be a source of frustration. Truly, I think that is the main thing that lands this level so far down the list, which would otherwise land itself in the middle of the pack. We've started treading into levels that are no longer meh, but actually fairly solid or even good. So despite this level being in the lower portion of the list, I think it just speaks for the upcoming levels being better. So Polar Guys being the gatekeeper to the better pack of levels sounds good to me. And here we have what is deemed the best level out of the original 7, by a fairly big margin score-wise, Jumper. I have to say though, I generally have nothing to comment about for this level other than the fact that the gameplay itself is balanced all throughout for most of it. There really isn't much room to breathe in this level, and the difficulty is balanced throughout. I'll let you all speak for me here. There are some really cool and original parts, like the first time we were introduced to Upside Down Flying and a claustrophobic cube part with the red background was so cool and satisfying. But holy cow, some parts are bad. The last ship with the bullet-like blocks is nothing special, and has been done before in Polarized. Jumper is a weird one. On one hand, I think in terms of the first 7 levels, Jumper has the best decoration, and the section from 88 to 100 has great sync. But besides that, I don't like the rest of the level. I think the 62 to 75% section is cool, but the rest is okay. What a silly little map. Everything feels refreshing thanks to more diversified gameplay and structures. The upside down ship should have been introduced earlier, but it's fine. The Q part at like 40% is very unique and fun, as you are constantly changing gravity in a compact area. This map is just good in every aspect. That's kind of the thing with Jumper. It's a solid level, but there's not much truly groundbreaking here other than the yellow gravity portal in the ship section. The first coin is insane to go for, and honestly almost way too hard for the main levels. And after that, it just does what it needs to do. The gameplay is well constructed and balanced, the decoration does what it needs to do, originality is somewhat holding back, and the music representation is spot on. Out of the original 1.0 levels, this was deemed the best one. And yes, on an objective standpoint, it definitely is. Man, to see the latest main level in the game all the way down here is not particularly great to see, but I can't say that I'm surprised since it genuinely doesn't really live up to the quality that was expected here. I feel emptiness whenever I play Finger Dash. It was a pretty hyped level, but at the end it just looked very generic with orbs that you could simply skip to some weird gimmicks. It feels like Robto just gave up halfway into the level's making and it became some generic level. Just a big meh. People who like Finger Dash could probably defend it from being a bad level, which is fair, but I would personally disagree in saying that it doesn't deserve being down here. 
The fact that a level with the most recent features available to the community performed things worse in comparison to levels from even the 1.3 update goes to show what a huge disappointment this level was. But okay, let's be fair, I'm going a bit too hard here. There are genuine positive comments that could be made regarding this level's approach, but truly, almost all the comments I have received from you all have had some hint of negativity. Finger Dash objectively has the best decoration out of all the main levels. It uses the new default blocks perfectly and almost feels like a tribute to the Mario Bros. series. The gameplay is not in its favor, on the other hand, because of how linear it feels. Well, considering that Finger Dash finds itself in the middle of the pack in 12th place, it would explain why people feel it's neither bad or good, but I think that this statement from one of the players summarized the entire problem with Finger Dash as a whole. I think Finger Dash is heavily rushed towards the last 40% of the level, since the decoration falls apart and becomes very 2.0-ish, empty and boring. Even the one-time speed drop is pretty underwhelming and boring. In my opinion, Finger Dash is a rushed level that had the potential to be a good one. I don't think I could have said it better myself. The attention to detail comparing the first half versus the second half of Finger Dash is laughable. It was very clear that Robtop gave up creating this level once he reached the halfway point. As a result, this level barely feels rewarding to overcome. Instead, we're just left with a taste of what this level could have been had Robtop spent more effort towards fully creating the level. Instead, it remains as a shell for something very mediocre. Well, here's a level I expected at the bottom, but here we are. In the middle of the pack, we find a 1.3 level X step. In terms of level design, this is one of the strangest main levels in the game for me, especially with the blue jump pads in the ship section scattered about everywhere. This is the first time we ever see these blue jump pads in the main levels. They are very quickly introduced in the cube to ship transition to give you an idea of what they do, and then you are thrown into a ship that doesn't demand you to use them. It's just a really strange choice. I also kind of struggle to have much to say about this one, so I'll let you all speak for me here again. It introduces blue pants in a very weird way, where it basically skips the safety introduction phase and jumps straight into playing around with the idea. It is a bit too crazy for a first introduction, and don't even get me started on the four lonely blue orbs that show up at the end of the level and nowhere else. Next up is a decent level, it has some unique parts as well as not being necessarily annoying to play. It is regrettable though that blue pads are only introduced in an auto part and then in a ship, which is definitely not a good way to introduce them. But to cut x from Slack, I don't think it is a bad level whatsoever, it's definitely in the better section of the levels out of the main pack. Unlike Cycles that came right before it, the designs in this level actually presents a fair bit of variety. This level is surprisingly well made, using chains and orbs, four ground spikes mixed together to form a saw blade of some kind, blue pads at the ship part used as annoyances more than actual hazards that you must avoid. All of this was very fascinating to look at the first time. The gameplay is fairly enjoyable and the song surprisingly fits well with the level. I'd say I agree with this. The approach to quality is a bit all over the place in this level, with some parts being very uniquely crafted and some gameplay aspects being rather questionable, like with the, all the blue orbs and jump pads. But other than the fact that I hate this song a ton, I can't disagree with this. Overall, it does what it needs to do and manages fairly well, but compared to the other levels that are to come up in the list, X-Step falls short in comparison. Okay, here's where I step in and I'm confused. Why is this level so far up? Before I even began ranking these levels with you all, Geometrical Dominator is one of the levels I pictured being in the bottom section of the list, but no, here we are, with it being in the middle of the pack. What am I missing here? Let's see what some of you have to say about this. Geometrical Dominator came out with a 2.0 update, which introduces the Moo Trigger and the Robot Game Mode. I think it does a very good job showing what 2.0 can do, with all the unique effects and blocks it contains. The dark flashy rainbow part is arguably the most unique for any of his levels, despite it being known as one of the least enjoyable parts in all of his levels. The sync is on point yet again, they both mesh very well together. I think this is Ruptop's best level, not just because of the hype he built with Waterflame before releasing 2.0 with a song commission, but also because of the very cool themes and gameplay. I find this level very fun and uses the song in a very creative way, especially the infamous dark part that most people hate. I think the dark part is really fun, since you can use the flashing lights beforehand. I also love how the rainbow blocks turn to grayscale and are in sync with the song right before the transition to the dark part. Okay, let me talk a bit about this dark part, since it is my main gripe with this level. I don't hate it that much, but there are some things with this section that I would call genuine problems. Yes, the blocks are indicated in the dark fairly well, you are able to roughly see where things are showing up in time. But my issue with this section is that it is not entirely clear what is going to show up. Will it be a standard pillar? Will there be a jump pad on it? Is it not a pillar, or rather an orb you need to press? The indicators never tell you which is which, they just tell you there is something there, and I don't think that the objects appear quick enough to actually have you react in time. 
I suppose some people could argue that defeats the purpose of having a memory section in the first place, but we've had memory sections in these older levels before. They never had been this bad at describing what's coming up. Clearly, I'm not the level's biggest fan. I just find it a bit unfathomable to see the level place what I expected to be really low, this high. But I suppose I can give credit where credit's due. The originality in this level is honestly top-notch. The amount of things going on in this level that had not been seen in any other Jump Dash level prior truly does make it for a unique experience. The song fits this level very nicely as well, considering it was a Water Flame song commissioned by Robtop, and the level definitely feels like it was built with this song in mind. I didn't expect to see this level to be so far up on this list, but this isn't my list after all. Well, here's one of my personal favorites, Theory of Everything. Not that I find the level to be an incredible masterpiece, but the song combined with the simple to understand mechanics with the new UFO game mode made it into a level I could really appreciate even back in the mobile days. Some of you seems to back up my statements. Theory of Everything is another amazing milestone level. Song representation is arguably the worst thing about it, and that says a lot considering that the representation is good on its own. I'd say out of the previous 11 levels, this is the most fun one by far, and it also introduces a new type of gameplay, memory style. Not to mention it introduces the UFO game mode. Robtop yet again does a great job at showing us the basics of this new game mode. The decoration is very unique. Up to this point, no level looks like it, especially with how it looked with the memory parts. I can definitely agree with most of this, the only thing I really wish wasn't in this level though is the way the memory sections are arranged. Thankfully this is a trend that has since then long died out since it is genuinely just annoying. If you take the wrong path you have to wait for 2-3 to three seconds each attempt just to die and try again, and depending on how many of these you arrange in a row, this can be a source of frustration very quickly. But thankfully, theory of everything has indicators, so it is not a big issue at all in this level. I find Theory of Everything to be very forgettable, like base after base. The only reason people remember it is because of the UFO and the hard coin in the one ship part. I can't give Theory of Everything another point in originality because it doesn't look that far off from Clutterfunk and the UFO is literally just Flappy Bird. Well, to cut Rupto some slack here, it would appear that the UFO is not inspired by Flappy Bird at all. I originally thought so too. The actual inspiration for the UFO comes from Rupto playing Darnox's level Gravity Field back in August 2013. Then in late January 2014, Robtop speaks for where the inspiration came from. Sure, Flappy Bird was released in May 2013, but that game didn't really hit cultural significance until early 2014, so I would definitely defend Theory of Everything from the criticism of UFO being an original. I don't think that is very fair to say. So while I do enjoy this level for what it is, I do also understand that it's not too special. It is a solid level, and I can definitely say with confidence that from this point forward, we've entered the good main levels category. With this level, I'm probably not going to sound very positive at all, since I genuinely really don't like this level's song, but I'll give it my best shot to give it the proper praises and criticisms it may have earned. To see Clutterfunk be above so many of the later main levels, including some of the ones from both the 2.0 and 2.1 update, goes to show how high the quality of this one is. Let's start off with what some of you are saying about Clutterfunk. Clutterfunk is an another highly influential level like Time Machine. It introduces the mini portal and saw blades. The gameplay is very enjoyable and challenging. The decoration is pretty good since at the time it was something pretty different and new when compared to the previous 10 levels. The song representation is perfect, or damn near perfect. I think that genuinely summarizes this level perfectly. This level is a massive difficulty spike compared to all the levels before it, and definitely is one of the big milestones in the main game. Much like Robtops' earlier works, Clutterfunk also does a very good job at introducing the new additions from the update, with one of you explaining exactly why. Clutterfunk does a really good job introducing the mini portal and does this in an almost mini world of sorts, where all the obstacles are scaled down to fit with the icon becoming smaller. As the level progresses, the use of the mini portal and its applications becomes more extreme, and the level ends climactically with a great section containing one of the best mini cube sections I've ever seen to this day. There's honestly a lot of truth to this statement. This minicube and the way it was designed became a classic on its own, with countless user levels pretty much being heavily inspired by it for a time. Nowadays you don't really see this happening too often, and while it doesn't carry the same influence as some of Robtops' demon levels, the game's cultural impact upon this level's release was astounding. But hey, it wouldn't be fair if we didn't look into a player's team to be negative about the level as well. Clutterfunk is much harder than Theory of Everything, but for some reason has less stars, the difficulty of the level is not balanced at all. The big cube in the beginning feels like a 5 star level, then the mini cube has a lot of timings and introducing timings in the mini cube feels wrong. It'll be better in the normal cube. 
While I don't agree with the assessment that timings in the minicube are bad, in fact I think they are very appropriate. The balance of difficulty in this level is ridiculous. If you take the first cube and compare it to the first ship, you'll almost wonder if you're playing the same level, due to how different their difficulties are. More or less, it can be a tad overwhelming, but I don't think it is a massive problem for other parts to be a bit harder than others. In Clutterfunk's case, the small balancing issue is probably what ended up with this level landing on the 8th spot, which otherwise may have been above the upcoming level, which is honestly insane to think about. Here we go. Arguably the most influential level that RobTop ever released has finally shown up on this list in 7th place. It has the highest average score for originality out of all the main levels with almost 8.5 out of 10 and it 100% deserves that. The amount of unique creations and ideas going on in this level are innumerable. The most notable of these is of course the most classic design in Geometry Dash history, the Clubstep Monster, which for anyone who is involved in a community won't need a description for what that is. If you're new though, I'll give you a quick explanation. The general design for this implied a structure in the air with an opening for the player to traverse through, which is usually the mouth with spikes representing teeth. The upper structure would be wide enough to have two blocks empty with either cogwheels or orbs representing the monster's eyes, and that would be the basic design. This single creation is still made in levels today. It is practically timeless. And yet, despite this level's influence on the community and game as a whole, we find this level outside of the top five. Why is that? Well, let's see what people say. Clubstep is such an iconic level. Being the first main demon that introduced the Clubstep monsters, it really left a huge mark to the GD community. The gameplay feels like a step up in difficulty compared to the main insanes, as it has a lot of fakes, as well as tight control based ship parts. The deco, however, isn't as good as the Electroman Adventures, despite beneficiating from invincible blocks which aren't in Electroman for some reason. I think this statement is rather fair. While Clubstep has an incredible impact, compared to the other level that was released next to it in the same update, it does feel somewhat unexplored in the new features that was added in this update. Clubstep at times feels like it would belong in the update prior to the one the level came out in. To be fair, it might have been an aesthetic choice all around, so maybe this level just chose to not express in the new block designs as much. But comparing the 1.6 update designs from Electroman Adventures to Clubstep, the latter feels lesser and more incomplete. It feels like it was attached later as an afterthought in the case of Clubstep. Maybe that is just me, but that is how it feels like personally. But other than that, I can't think of any other complaints and neither can any of you it seems. Other than some claims about bugging and unbalanced gameplay, there is nothing but praises for this level. Clubstep is a near perfect level in my opinion. Its gameplay is hard but very fair, and also introduces the player to the idea of practicing levels a lot in order to know the parts well enough to beat it, as opposed to playing from the start and brute forcing the completion. The decoration is amazing, with many new ideas such as the now famous Clubstep Monster, appearing many times throughout the level. It is extremely original, and the level contains many different fakes among other things where the player is being introduced to a concept which is clearly built upon everything learned in the previous 13 levels. The representation of the song is also done very well, and it really goes to show that RobTap wanted to make one of the best possible levels for its time. Spot on my friend. I think the general consensus we can take from this is that Clubstep doesn't find itself down here for something inherently negative, but rather that the quality of the remaining levels are all so high that they outshine what Clubstep accomplishes. Clubstep is a great level, and the upcoming levels just performs even better. Or so I thought. Nah, I'm kidding, this is not a bad level at all, but this is not the level I expected to see above the first robbed up demon ever created. Blast processing is great, and it finally takes a step back in difficulty while still being extremely fun. It introduces probably the most popular game mode of all time, the Wave, in an easy to understand but satisfying way. The level serves as a great introduction to 1.9, and really it's just a laid back level meant to give the player a well needed break in progression. Pretty much a great statement to summarize Blast Processing. The Wave game mode is definitely the most popular game mode in the game today, and this level does a great job at introducing it to the game. It's simple, easy to understand, and not overwhelmingly difficult, and even in the dual mode it is explained really well. But not everyone seems to feel the same level of positivity towards the level. In fact, there are more negative comments here as opposed to Clubstep. The first half of this level is very strong, as it has a really great mechanical slash computer theme. The Wave is a really technical game mode, and I think it fits perfectly here. However, the level unfortunately trails off as it goes on, feeling more like a hexagon force rehash at times. 
Another one of you says, It's a solid level that tends to drag on. It doesn't help that everything is the same speed. It introduces the wave just fine, which isn't that bad for a best quality, I suppose. It just makes you want more than what you're given. A fair assessment. You're pretty much introduced to the wave game mode really well, and there's a lot of quality to be appreciated in the first half. But I think it is fair to say that blast processing has no intensity at all. The level is very basic in that sense, and yeah, I know, it is meant to be a fairly easy level, but Finger Dash and Geometrical Dominator both are at a similar difficulty range, and they use speed triggers and complement intensity a whole lot better. It is surprising to see a level with issues much more present above levels like Clubstep and Clutterfunk. But that is the surprises of surveys for you. Hey, it's the level that gives the Creeper Cube upon completion. Songwise, this is definitely one of my favorites out of the main levels. One of the comments from you all regarding Hexagon Force honestly speaks for everything you need to know about this level. Raptor clearly knew what he was doing in this era of the game, because this is the third level in a row of extremely high quality. Hexagon Force introduces the duel. The introduction of the duel is done very well, starting the player off with some easy and basic timings, before switching for a moment to an asymmetrical duel, where equally timed jumps don't exist and can't be performed. The duel at around 70%, which uses the mini ball and mini ship, is done very well, using elements of symmetry and asymmetry to create high intensity and fast paced gameplay. The main thing that makes this level great aside from the unique decoration, duels and slopes is that it increases the intensity throughout the entire level, until the song reaches a climax around 80-90%. to The level ends slowly, serving almost as a finale to the early area of the game, right before the revolution that is 1.9. I honestly love this comment, to me it is the perfect description for what is so great about this level. It is definitely one of my favorite levels personally, and this comment encapsulates my thoughts perfectly. But of course, as with every other main level, not everyone thinks this way. Dual game mode was introduced very poorly. If it was the second level that uses duels, it would be fine, but the duels have some really weird timings and should be easier since it is the first time the game uses them. I wouldn't really agree with this, as I think it would defeat the purpose of introducing the duel gimmick in the first place. By creating just a simple symmetric duel, where each jump is identical, all you're creating there is another cube to look at without needing to pay much attention to it whatsoever. So I would definitely say that an asymmetric setup is a must-have for when introducing this gimmick, especially for a dual cube. And even then, the duel begins with symmetrical jumps to immediately get you used to what you see in front of you. So personally, I view this level to be exactly where it should be. It definitely deserves the high placement that it has on this list. Okay, this is a definite upset for me here, since I genuinely believe that Deadlock has some of the worst gameplay in the entire main level catalog. I will go into why very briefly, but first off, I will be letting the comments I got speak for what this level does really well. Deadlocked, when thinking about it in retrospect, is the best main level. The gameplay is about as thrilling as Electrodynamics, apart from a few of the slower parts. The decoration is fantastic and the song representation is great, but the best part is that it's the most original level. It took what was done in Geometrical Dominator and expanded on it. This is very fair to say. One thing you can't fault Deadlock for is its effort in presentation variety. There's a lot of different themes, decorations, and gameplay ideas in this level, and it was clear that Ruptop had a lot of spare creativity for the level. That being said though, majority of you, including myself, appear to think it didn't quite succeed with implementing them fairly. Rob experimenting with 3x speed wave and moving objects absolutely ruined the gameplay. Wave parts are absolutely luck based and the worst part about them, the whole wave section is very easy but the spams are inconsistent and much harder than the rest of the gameplay. Another annoying part is the transition to the 80% ship. I can't control where you will turn from wave into a ship and I won't know how high you need to fly up. And in the exact same second I need to make a really hard ship maneuver, which combined with this trap transition makes this moment so annoying and impossible to do consistently. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. Let's start with the wave spam section. For some reason, Robtop resorted to creating a big wave spam duel in a 3 times speed section, which isn't challenging or interesting, it's just frustrating. This was also built to be played on mobile, which makes it even more unreasonable to imagine why this was a good gameplay idea. Robtop has shown many times before that he doesn't need to rely on spammy or inconsistent gameplay arrangements to create some really intense and fun gameplay in his levels. This gameplay choice feels almost inexcusable in comparison to everything else he has produced, and unfortunately the bad gameplay doesn't end after that, as this comment from one user simply said, the transition at 78%. This 
godforsaken transition. Even nowadays, with years of playing experience down the line, this transition is still absolutely god-awful. A mini-wave into a big ship portal where you have to immediately control the vertical position of the ship. This transition will never ever be the exact same due to how the wave enters this transition. So the start point of the ship will be slightly different every time, especially when playing on mobile. Sometimes the ship will be slightly higher up than normal, or sometimes it will be slightly lower down than normal. Absolute trash! I genuinely believe that this section is what puts a severe dent in this level's general score, and it might have even been put at the very top if this was executed better. Generally speaking though, there's a lot to love about the level. Most of the gameplay, decoration presenting a ton of new features implemented into the update, originality being top notch, and music representation being at a high tier, all beautifully crafted in exception to the aforementioned parts. As a result, this level finds itself on the spot for the fourth best main level in Geometry Dash. And here we are with what is deemed the best demon Ruptop has ever produced Theory of Everything 2. I do also think that this demon is my personal favorite out of the three demons that Robtop has created. Theory of Everything 2, the sequel of its predecessor. It certainly did not disappoint, as blast processing was easy. This one became the hardest Robtop level over Clubstep. It truly showcases the best of what he could do at this point in time, possessing a good challenge for all game modes in exception to the duel. Another milestone level, and it is certainly very deserving. The song representation is once again perfect, as I believe the gameplay and decorations suit the song as well as anything. You and me both there, my friend. Not only is the song choice top notch, multiple sections in this level are memorable by their design approach alone. The first cube, the first ship, the first wave, the quiet piano part of the level, and the final club step monster made out of slopes that the cube glides on at the very end. There's a genuine approach to creativity all throughout this level. It felt like Brotop was having a lot of fun making this, and it felt passionate. It is a wonderful level, and I can barely even think of any major issues with this level at all. Some of you, however, have voiced your complaints, which I'll go ahead and mention a few. The biggest drawback in Theory Everything 2 has to be the balancing. It is too punishing at times, especially the last ship part. It's a great challenge for players, but it is also a brutal one. Second UFO after the ball is really awkwardly lined up, and the last ship part is honestly a meme because of how unbalanced it is, but the music goes along perfectly, and the gameplay flows really naturally once you learn it. Pretty annoying level with hardest parts being only ships, and they are executed much worse compared to Clubstep. There appears to be a general complaint thrown towards this demon, which is that the ship parts are by a pretty big margin the hardest sections. I'd probably say the same, especially that ship at 80%, which is a huge difficulty spike compared to the sections next to it. But much like with other main levels like Clutterfunk, the complaints stems around the balancing between different sections and just that. There are many other complaints that appear frequently. I think I can finish off talking about this level by using this player's comment. Theory of Everything 2 is a great level, with almost every aspect being near perfect. It is a demon difficulty level with some hard gameplay that may take time to learn. That being said, like Clubstep, it takes pretty much everything from every preceding level and combines it into one level, which still being highly original with things like the memory ball. Really great level which should be the standard for all creators with these four categories in mind. Indeed it should. Perhaps one day, my friend. I have to say, Electrodynamics is probably the level I expected to be our number one winner, but no. Here we are at it being ranked as the second best out of the main levels in Geometry Dash. This level received the highest score in any category compared to all other main levels, in this instance being the music representation with an average score of 8.398 out of 10. That being said though, the reception towards the level's gameplay is all over the place in this instance. The worst main level bar none. Unbalanced, unfair, almost everything looks super desaturated and devoid of life. Once it speeds up, it never slows down, despite the song calling for that. It's almost like Ruptop was high on something when he made it. Damn, man, you really went hard on this level. But I cannot say I agree with almost anything in this statement. You mean to tell me that Electrodynamics, the most colorful level in the game so far, and is probably the first one that would indicate the game to have an epilepsy warning, looks super desaturated? I know this is influenced mainly by the colors of your icon, but if anything, if Electrodynamics' colors comes across as desaturated, I feel like that reflects more what your icons' colors are. I can definitely understand where the unfair and lack of bouncing statements come from, though. 
The second ship with 3 times speed and the ending are way too hard. The level is not balanced at all and the invisible quad spikes at 10% are just not good. The rest of the level is a blast to play. I know we have talked about the lack of proper balancing in previous main levels on this list, but I would honestly say that in this instance that they work in Electrodynamics' favor for me. In my mobile days with the game, Electrodynamics took me a long time to beat, and the main factor with that was that the 3x speed ships existed. But truthfully, I'm really glad the other parts of the level aren't as hard, so that you can get to the sections where I really wanted to show off much easier. People might complain that the ships should have been made easier, but I'd say that song representation also reflects the difficulty for me. The song for Electrodynamics is absolutely insane in terms of intensity, and the points where the level truly picks up in difficulty is when the song really goes all out. Then there are a couple of instances in the level where people complain about blind jumps, one instance at 10%, and then the three quad jumps near the end of the level, which I suppose some people could argue is blind. But I would once more disagree, since Rotop did something rather smart, and added a structure above them, indicating where the spikes are located once you cannot see them. Sure, it might not be the best solution, and truthfully, might have been better if he had created something else there entirely, but I don't think it impacts the quality of the level as a whole. As you can see though, there are people who absolutely despise this level, and it probably is the reason we don't find Electrodynamics in the top spot. The comments from those who love this level, however, are incredibly descriptive. Electrodynamics is clearly one of the best main levels. You finish club step only to find a level of, in my opinion, near equal difficulty. The gameplay of this level is perfect. It's intense, hard, fast paced, uses nearly all previously learned game modes and other ideas and probably has the best music representation of any main level. This level is pretty much the death moon of 1.7 and could have only been made better had it been longer and included the second part of the song. Nothing more to say really. While I would personally say that the length of the level is definitely enough considering how tough some of these sections are, everything else in the level is of the highest caliber to me. To me, it goes to show that in terms of level creating, Robtop hit his peak during the update 1.6 to 1.9 era, with a batch of levels with very high production quality. It was during this time where according to a small portion of the community that the best levels were released, and I am definitely inclined to believe the exact same thing. Speaking of which... Not at all what I expected to see at the very top of this list, but it is also not particularly surprising. The survey revealed that Electroman Adventures is deemed the best main level in Geometry Dash, and while people could argue that the accuracy of the survey has some elements of bias that can never be removed, honestly, who the hell cares? Electroman Adventures isn't a bad level whatsoever, nowhere near it. This level is absolutely incredible. I love the gameplay, the decoration, the song, the coins, the sync, and pretty much everything. It's a favorite for others, and I can clearly see why. Electroman clearly rocks. The mini ship slash UFO midway through the level truly don't do this level any justice because most of it sinks insanely well. With this, alongside Theory of Everything, Clutter Funk, and X Step, Rotop clearly gets how to utilize the cubes' potential. Overall, probably the best level to have come out since Dryout, and perhaps the best level yet. 9 out of 10. Ladies and gentlemen, behold the first 10 out of 10! Well, unfortunately, no, but it became the. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, no, but it became the only main level out of the entire list to get an overall average score of 8 out of 10. There are many prices to be made towards this level, and quite frankly, it is nothing but a great time all around. But there are a couple of complaints for the level, though, which I will say are rather justified. The only problem this level has is that it introduces breakable blocks, which is fine, but they aren't utilized enough or creatively enough. This level is also a bit on the easier side, which is fine, but I'd expect the difficulty to continue increasing from the previous two levels, considering what comes next. I wouldn't say that they have to keep getting harder and harder, although I definitely would not want another Stereo Madness. But there's definitely truth in the statement about the breakable blocks. As far as I know and remember, the only time we see them is at the first cube, and then they never show up again. The community's user levels have found countless ways to utilize these additions for better or worse, depending on what level we're talking about. But yeah, I think that is a miss on Robtop's part, not really using them more, since they are a unique idea and there are many things that could be done with them. But thankfully, it is only a pet peeve, and I can get behind saying that too. While once more, it isn't the level I expected to find at the very top, I can definitely understand why it ended up here. With this, I can gladly state to the entire community that Electroman Adventures is deemed the best main level in the game. And that concludes the end of this video. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video. Peace.